Good day everyone. You're welcome to today's learning session. Today we'll be looking at another operations management model. And the topic we'll be looking at today is facility location. We'll be looking at what are the factors to consider when locating a facility and what are the solution techniques that can be adopted. As our practice is, we will have a word of counsel that will give us a bedrock for our success. And we'll be finding it today from Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. And I read, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate during day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then shalt thou have good success. Success is qualified in this text. To show us that if there is a good success, it then means there is a bad success. God does not want us to be successful in the wrong path, in the wrong light. He wants us to be successful in the right light. And how can we be truly successful? We can only be truly successful as we follow the instructions of God as laid out in his word. The Bible and the Bible alone should be the standard rule for our lives. As we do this, as we meditate on God's word, as we give the more earnest heed to God's word, as we yield ourselves in obedience and submit our will to him, we will be truly successful. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we plead with you that the grace to submit our will to you, the grace to follow you with, the whole, with our whole heart like Caleb and Joshua did, please grant unto us and bless everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name, Amen. Facility location is a topic for today. One of the most important and strategic decisions that an operations manager must take is where to site his facility. Because a wrong location of a facility, no matter how good the managers are, will lead to a wrong result. So when picking a when when considering locating your facility, what should you consider? The first is cost consideration. Will you achieve a minimum cost? Will you be able to get your raw materials easily? Nearness to raw material. Because the farther you are from your raw material, the more expensive it becomes to transport those raw material to the places where it is needed. The availability of manpower. If the human resources, the human personnel are not available to carry out the tax in that area you are citing your facility, it will be difficult. And so you need to consider that. The level of infrastructural facility. How developed is the area? Do we have access to road, water, power supply? All of this needs to be considered. Government policies and legislation. There are some government policies that will ban the establishment of companies in certain areas. Do not tread on a wrong one. The culture and religion of the people in that locality. For instance, in the north, it is against their tradition and religion that a brewery be established. So it will be wrong for Nigeria Brewery to go to the heart of the northern place and maybe locate their brewery in front of a mosque. They must be looking for a serious trouble. Security issues needs to be considered so that you do not risk the life of your workers and equipment. Factors that could motivate an existing organization to establish other factories. One, when there is an increase in demand for the existing product and the current facility can no longer meet that demand, then you may be thinking of expansion. Activities of competitors is also another thing that drives expansion. Creation of a new product, government policies, insecurity. And when an organization wants to expand, there are three options they can take. One, they can expand on the current location. They can choose to get a new space and extend to that new area. They can look for a large portion of land and move both the old and the new to that area. Now, there are solution methods that, um, that, we, that can be used in solving the issue of facility location. One of the approaches is the dimensional analysis approach, the simple ranking of alternative, the linear assignment model, the linear transportation model, the quadratic assignment model, the heuristic assignment model. But at this stage, we will consider the dimensional analysis approach, the linear assignment model, and the linear transportation model. 
Let's go on with the dimensional analysis approach. This approach was developed by Bridgman, and by using this approach, you consider both the cost and non-cost factors. And basically, when using the dimensional analysis approach, it is restricted because you can only consider two locations. Once the location is more than two, the dimensional analysis approach may not work. And how do you calculate that? The cost of location X divided by the cost of location Y. And the cost of this location must be raised to their respective weight. For the dimensional analysis approach, weight is attached to each respective cost. And so the cost of location Y divided by the cost of location, the cost of location X divided by the cost of location Y with a raise to the power of their respective weight will give you a value. The value must be less and at most equal to one. If the value obtained is higher than one, then the, the, the location Y is more attractive. That's the second location. But if the value you get is less than one, then the first location. So when we say cost of location X over cost of location Y, it is simply your first location divided by your second location. So if the value you get at the end of the day is less than one, then the first location, which is your numerator, is more preferable. And if the value you get is greater than one, then the second location, which is your denominator, is the most appropriate location. Let's take a look at this example. Hong Kong University is considering creating the creation of another campus due to sudden student explosion. High tech management consultant has been asked by the management to consider their proposed location, either at Peru or at Kene, both located in Ogun State. These are the figures below. We have the factors to consider land, building, personnel, research expenses, transport community acceptability and infrastructure and we have their respective cost and we have their respective weight now how do we solve it cost of location x Peru, over cost of location y since they are both in the same dimensions 1.5 raised to the power of 7 that's the mid that's the part that's the weight times 3.0 raised to the power of 7 times 2.1 raised to the power of 7 the respective cost of under each location raised to their respective power gave us this at the end of the day they got 0 0.63 and of course 0 0.63 is a value that is less than one and if 0 0.63 is less than one then the cost location x is a preferable location and that is why location x was p so please let's take note of that that the reason why the Peru was picked as a preferred location was because of the value gotten, which is 0 0.63, which is less than 1. We go to the next one, which is the linear assignment model. The linear assignment model is a deterministic mathematical model. So the next technique we'll be looking at is the linear assignment model. What is the linear assignment model all about? The linear assignment model is a deterministic mathematical model applied when the management decides to make an optimum use of its capacity. When an organization is faced with several options and they need to make an optimal decision, for the dimensional analysis approach, it's just two locations that are being considered. A situation where an organization had to consider five, seven locations and who to assign to those locations, which facility to take on and which one not to, the linear assignment model can be used. And there are two main approaches that can be used, the minimization approach and the maximization approach. When you have a question or a case study before you, you need to look at the question if it is a minimization question or a maximization question. How do you identify a maximization question? You see whether they want to they want to make the most of it or make the least of it. For instance, an organization needs to maximize profit, they need to maximize efficiency, maximize the potential of their workers. But when it comes to minimization, they need to minimize cost, they need to minimize risk, they need to minimize the distance travel. So depending on the case scenario that is presented before you, you would know whether it is a maximization or a minimization question. Whether it is a maximization or a minimization, there are two main approaches that can be used. We have the Hungarian approach and the branch and bound techniques. 
The Hungarian approach is one that has several algorithms that we would have to go through in order for the problem to be solved. We're going to look at an example. When solving for minimization, there are steps to adopt. And when solving a maximization question, there are steps to adopt. The first step for a minimization question is to write out the initial matrix. So whether it's a minimization or a maximization question, you are required to write out the initial matrix and check whether the number of rows is equal to the number of columns. If the number of rows is equal to the number of columns, then it is a balanced matrix. But if it is not, it then means it is an unbalanced matrix and you need to create a dummy row or a dummy column as the case may be. The second step is to carry out the row reduction. What do we mean by row reduction? It is identifying the smallest element in each row and deducting all other elements from it. The third step is to carry out a colon reduction. And just like was done in the case of the row reduction, identifying the smallest element in each row and deducting all others from it. The colon reduction requires you to, stop, to identify all the smallest element in each colon and deduct all other elements from it. Step four, identify the number of unique zeros and draw a straight line on them, beginning from the line, the row or the colon with the highest number of unique zeros. That's step five. Apply the minimum number of possible lines on the unique zeros, starting with either the row or the colon with the highest number of unique zeros. Please note that ties are broken arbitrarily. What do we mean? That is, if you have the same number of unique zeros, for instance, I have two unique zeros on the row, I have two unique zeros on the column. I am free to draw the line from any of those, um, any of the, or any of those allocations. That is what we mean when we say ties are broken arbitrarily. Count the number of minimum, minimum lines rule and compare with the number of assignments and the number of tasks. That is, compare the number of columns with the number of rows and the number of lines rule. If M, that is the number of rows, is equal to the number of columns and is equal to the number of lines ruled, if these three agrees, then it means optimality has been attained and you can assign from there. However, if M is not equal to N and it is not equal, or M is equal to N, but it's not equal to the number of line rule, you need to continue the process. And how do you continue the process? By identifying the smallest uncovered element in the last matrix, subtract it from all other uncovered elements and add it to the point of intersection. And then repeat steps four, five, and six until optimality has been attained. And the last step says assign jobs starting with the row with single unique zero and pick its corresponding value in the matrix. It's a very simple nine steps. And then we will look at an example. There's a question before us. The management of Cadbury is interested in assigning their newly employed managers to the new branches of there are hospitals located at Lagos, Abuja, and Kanu. Please move the class. The management of Cadbury is interested in assigning their newly employed managers to the new branches located at Lagos, Abuja, Kanu, and Aba. The cost implication and profit is of interest. However, the managing director desires to focus on cost assist the managing director to assign their newly employed directors to the appropriate location and calculate the total cost of operations per quarter using the information in the matrix below. Now, from this illustration, we know that cost is the major point of focus. And so when it is cost, it has to do with minimization. We would go over to the board and work it out. So please write with me as we go. Okay, from this example, we actually want to see how the operations manager is going to divide the various branches 
amongst the newly employed managers. So we have four newly employed managers, Prince Will, Harper, Saint, Daniel, and Sarah, to be allocated to four different locations, Lagos, Abuja, Kano, and Abra. And as the question stated, it says that profit and cost are of priority to the organization. However, the organization has decided to focus on costs. And that's a clause that you need to take note of in the question. So this is a cost matrix. And using the Hungarian approach, you are going to be solving it using the minimization method. Why? Because we seek to minimize cost and not maximize cost. So the first step says write out the initial matrix. The initial matrix has been written out. The second step requires you to perform a role reduction. Now the question is how do you do a role reduction? Very simple. You identify the smallest element in each row and deduct all other elements from that smallest element. Okay, so from row one, the smallest element is 360. From row two, the smallest element is 760. From row three, the smallest element is 600. And the last but not the least row, the fourth row, the smallest element is 650. So that's the first step in performing a row reduction. After identifying the smallest element in each row, you deduct all other elements from it in order to get your next matrix. So how do we do that? 950 minus 360, 610 minus 360, 980 minus 360, and 360 minus 360. Gives you the element in the new row. So let's look at what the element in the new row will be. The first element having subtracted it will give you 590. The second one will give you 250. And deducting the third element from 360, you're going to have the sum of 620. And 360 minus 360 will give you zero. So that's the first step in getting the element in the row. We go to the next row. 960 minus 760, what do you have here? You have 200. 760 minus 760 gives you an element of zero. 890 minus 760 gives you 130. And the last is 1040 minus 760, which gives you 280. The next row, you subtract it from the smallest element, just as you have done in the previous two. So 600 minus 600 gives you zero. 940 minus 600 gives you the sum of 340. 670 minus 600 gives you the sum of 70. And 850 minus 600 gives you the sum of 250. The next element, 750 minus 650 gives you the sum of 100. 650 minus 650 gives you the sum of 0. 1140 minus 650 gives you the sum of 490. And 750 minus 650 gives you the sum of 100. Now with this, the second step is completed, which is the row reduction. Please take note. This becomes your row reduction matrix which is your second matrix. You are not expected to do it on a single table. You are expected to do it on different tables. Each 
summation or each addition forms a new matrix on its own, which should come up on a new table. But for the sake of teaching and the board space, that is why I am using the initial table. But for you as a student, you need to draw a new table to show your various steps. So on the row reduction table, the smallest element will no longer be there. You should identify it in your previous table. Now, having completed your row reduction table, the next table you are to get is your colon reduction table. And how do you do that? You do that by identifying the smallest element in each colon. And what is the smallest element in the first colon? The smallest element in the first colon is zero. In the second colon is zero. In the third colon is 70. And in the last colon is zero. Having identified the smallest element in each colon, the next step is to carry out a colon reduction. So this becomes your colon reduction matrix. And in order to carry out your colon reduction, you deduct all the elements in your new matrix. Please note, you don't go back to your initial matrix. You deduct the, all the elements in your latest matrix from, you deduct the smallest element from it. Now, taking a look at this matrix, the first colon is zero, the second colon is zero, and the last colon is zero. Meaning the first, the second, and the last colon elements will remain the same because anything subtracted from zero will give you the same value. So the only elements that will change is the third colon, which is the colon for Kanu. And so what are we doing? We're going to be deducting 70 from 620, 130 minus 70, 70 minus 70, and 490 minus 70. So when we do 620 minus 70, what do we have? We have a sum of 550. 130 minus 70 gives us a sum of 60. 70 minus 70 gives us a sum of 0. And 490 minus 70 gives us a sum of 420. Beautiful. So having done this, you have accomplished your third step, which requires you to perform a colon reduction. The next step requires you to apply your straight lines. Now, how do we do it? The rule says, do not cover the zero element twice. So the first step is to identify your number of unique zeros on your row as well as on your column. So let's begin by identifying the number of unique zeros on our row. So for the row, we want to identify how many unique zeros we have. So for the first row, we have just one unique zero. For the second row, we have one unique zero. For the third, we have two. And for the last, we have one. Having identified that, you also identify the same on each column. Number of unique zeros. For the first column, we have one unique zero. For the second, we have two. For the third, we have one. And for the fourth, we have one. We are done with the next step. And so you need to apply your straight line. The rule in application of straight line requires you to begin your ruling of straight line from the row or the column with the highest number of unique zeros. Please note, ties are broken arbitrarily. Once we have a tie between the row and the column, you can actually apply a straight line either beginning from the column 
or from the root. Now let's take a look at this. The row or the column with the highest number of unique zero is the third row and the second column. That is Daniel and Abuja. Now having that, you can actually begin by ruling your straight line either from the column or from the row. So let's assume I want to start from the row. I rule a line and this is my first straight line. I look out for the one with the highest number of unique zeros again and that takes me to Abuja. I rule a line and this becomes my second line. I look out for any other uncovered element that is a zero element. And in order to identify the next element that is not covered, I have just one zero left. And that is between Prince Will and Abba. So on Prince Will, it is one. On Abba, which is a colon, it is one. And like I said earlier, on ties are broken arbitrarily. So I rule this, and this becomes my third line. I look out if there's any other zero element that is not covered. And taking a look at this, all my zero elements are covered. So the next thing is for me to test for optimality. So how do I test for optimality? Using the Hungarian method, optimality is attained when M is equal to n and n is equal to the number of line ruled. Now, if we look at our n, which is the number of locations, we have four locations. We look at our n, which is your number of rows, and that is the number of managers, it is equal to four. But let's look at the number of lines that are ruled. We have the first line, we have the second line, and we have the third line. So, 4 is equal to 4, but it is not equal to the number of lines ruled. Because the number of lines ruled, lines ruled are just 3. And so, based on this, optimality is not attained. And once optimality is not attained, we need to continue the process. Now, the question is, how do you continue the process? You continue the process by identifying the smallest uncovered element and subtracting that smallest uncovered element from all other uncovered elements and adding it to the point of intersection. Please take note. You identify the smallest uncovered element. You subtract that, um, that smallest uncovered element from all other uncovered elements and add it to the point of intersection. Now let's take a look at this matrix. The smallest uncovered element is 60. And so, you are going to subtract 60 from all other uncovered elements. To identify our new matrix now, as earlier on stated, you subtract the smallest uncovered element from all other uncovered elements and add it to the point of intersection. Now, looking at Prince Will and Lagos, 590 would still be retained in our new matrix. Why? Because it is a covered element and it is not a point of intersection, so you do nothing to it. We move on to the next one, which is 250. Now, this was a point of intersection. 250 was a point of intersection because the element was covered vertically and horizontally. Meaning there was a straight line ruled vertically and there was a straight line ruled horizontally. It was only two points that had that issue. It was 250 at this point and 340 at this point. Please check it from your previous matrix. And you see that these were the only two points of intersection. So the question is, what do I do with this point? At this point, I will add the smallest uncovered element to the element in that, in that matrix. And that is 250 plus 60, which gives me a sum of 310. The next element was 550 and it was covered, so I retained it as 550. The next element was zero and it was covered, I retain it as zero. 
I go to the next row, which is Herbert Singh. Herbert Singh, the first element is 200, and it was not covered. So the rule requires you to subtract all other uncovered elements from it. So what does this become? 200 minus 60, and this becomes 140. 140, the next element was covered once, and you leave it at zero. This was the smallest uncovered element. And so you're going to subtract it from itself. So 60 minus 60 will give you a sum of zero. 280 minus 60 gives you the sum of 220. You go to Daniel. Daniel had a covered element of zero. It's retained as zero. Between Daniel and Abuja, there was an intersection at this point, and that was 340. So we add it, the rule says add it to the point of intersection. And so in order to add it, that becomes 340 plus 60, and that gives us a sum of 400. The next element was zero, and it was covered, so it's retained at zero. The next element was 250 and it was covered, so it is retained as 250. Between Sarah and Lagos was 100 and it is not covered. So this new element becomes 40, 100 minus 60. The next element was covered, which is a zero. The next element was not covered. 420 minus 60 gives you the sum of 320. 360 rather, sorry, 420 minus 60 gives you the sum of 360. The last element, which is 100, was also not covered. Subtracting the smallest uncovered element from it gives you a sum of 40. So this is your new matrix. And in this new matrix, you need to apply, to check for your number of unique zeros and apply your straight line, just as we did in the previous steps. So let's look at it. I have one unique zero, two unique zeros, two unique zeros at this point, one at this point. On the first column, I have one unique zero, two unique zeros, two unique zeros, and one unique zero. Now you need to apply your straight line rule again, beginning from either the row or the column with the highest number of unique zeros. And do not forget that ties are broken arbitrarily. So my first, this is two, 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 two. So I can actually begin the ruling of my line from any of them. So let's assume I want to begin from this Hubbard scene. So this is my first line. I move over and I look out for where do I have two unique zeros? I still have it on Daniel. And this is my second line. I look out for it again. Do I have any two unique zeros anywhere? No. Okay, so we go to the remaining zeros that are not covered. This is not covered, and this is not covered. Now, I can rule this this way, but since it was initially two, it is better I rule it this way. Let's take note. I said no unique zero should be covered twice. Do not assume that this unique zero is covered twice. I am not covering this line is not necessitated because of this zero. What necessitated this line was this zero. And so because it was this zero that I am ruling this line for, it should not be taken as covering a unique zero twice. And so the last one is this. It has one and one, so I can also cover it anyhow. So that becomes one, two, three, and four. Four. So now I have four lines. Room. I'm going to test for optimality again and see if my number of locations or branches is equal my number of managers and is equal the number of lines room. And from here we can see that the number of locations is four, the number of managers are four, and the number of line room lines room are four. And so and so based on this we can say optimality has been attained. And once optimality has been attained, it is now time to assign. Based on this, 
having attained optimality. So how do we assign? That's very simple. What you need to look out for is to look out for where you have a zero on each of the managers or people to be assigned. Now, for instance, on the first row, Prince Will can only be assigned to a bank as a location. Why? Because that is the only place where you have zero. So I come here and I say Prince Will, the only possible branch to assign Prince Will to is Abba. And so I go ahead and assign him. You check your initial matrix. That's your very first matrix. What was the cost of assigning Prince Will to Abba? It was a sum of 360,000 Naira. We move on to the next person, Habat Singh. Habat Singh can be assigned to either Abuja, the possible location, and Abuja or Kanu. And so since he has two possible locations, Abuja or Kanu, you're going to hold on with that and assign others that have only one possible location. Now let's go to Daniel. Daniel can ask, be assigned to either Lagos, or Kanu. He has two possible locations. You hold on with that. And the last but not the least, Sarah can only be assigned to Abuja. And please take note, always assign people with a single location first before others. So Sarah goes to Abuja. And when Sarah goes to Abuja, the cost of sending Sarah to Abuja is 650,000 euro. So if Sarah goes to Abuja, that automatically nullifies Abuja for her vaccine. So her vaccine is left with the option of going to only Kanu. And so you assign her vaccine to Kanu. And the cost of assigning her vaccine to Kanu is 760 so if her vaccine has gone to Kano, Daniel can no longer go to Kano. So the only option left for Daniel is to go to Lagos. And the cost of assigning Daniel to Lagos is 600,000 naira. And this is how you get the cost and where each manager can go to optimally as an operations manager using the Hungarian approach. So what do we do? You add up the entire cost for the organization. And this gives us a sum of 2,500,000 naira. Now please take note. The question requires you to calculate the quarterly cost and not the monthly cost. So since three months makes a quarter, in order to calculate the quarterly cost, it becomes 2.5 million multiplied by three since three months makes a quarter and that gives us the sum of 7.5 million so optimally the organization will incur the cost of 7.5 million which is the lowest possible cost that they can incur and it is best that prince will is assigned to Abba. Abba Singh goes to Kano, Daniel goes to Lagos and Sarah goes to Abuja optimally using the Hungarian approach. Thank you. In our next class, we will look at how to solve for the maximization method. Thank you. Okay, so now we are going to solve this next approach, which is the maximization approach using still the Hungarian method. You will recall that in the minimization method, there were various steps given. Now, for the maximization method, I'm going to explain two methods, two approaches that can be used. The alternative A method and the alternative B approach. For the alternative A approach, it's a very direct method, which entails identifying the highest in the entire matrix. So this profit is going to be seen as a profit matrix now, as against the focus on cost, the focus on this one will be on profit. 
So let's assume this is the profit that will be generated from sending these various managers to the various locations. And the organization wants to know what will be our optimal profit? Who should we send to where in order to attain optimality in profit, in order to maximize the profit? So in order to do that, there are two approaches that can be used. The alternative A approach requires you to identify the highest in the entire matrix, which is 1,140. Subtract all other elements from it. Once you do that, you have converted this matrix to a cost matrix. And then you can follow the entire minimization procedure by doing your row reduction, your colon reduction, the number of unique zeros, apply a straight line and get your answer. However, for the alternative B approach, which is what we will adopt now, the first step requires you to identify the highest element in each row. So I come here and I identify the highest element in each row. So for row 1, the highest element is 980. For row 2, the highest element is 1040. For row 3, the highest element is 950. The highest element in row 3 is 940. The highest element in row 4 is 1140. So having identified the highest element in each matrix, you subtract all other elements from it. You subtract all other elements from it. And that is known as our row reduction. So how do we do that? 980 minus 950 gives us the sum of 30. 980 minus 610 gives us the sum of 370. 980 minus 980 gives us the sum of 0. And 980 minus 360 gives us the sum of 620. So we go to the second row. 1040 minus 960 gives us the sum of 80. 1040 minus 760 gives us the sum of 280. 1040 minus 890 gives us the sum of 150. And 1040 minus 1040 gives us the sum of 0. The next one, 940 minus 600 gives us the sum of 340. 940 minus 940 gives us the sum of 0. 940 minus 670 gives us the sum of 270. And 940 minus 850 gives us the sum of 90. 1140 minus 750 gives us the sum of 390. 1140 minus 650 gives us the sum of 490. 1140 minus 1140 gives us the sum of 0. And 1140 minus 750 gives us the sum of 390. So we are done carrying out a row reduction. Remember, we are dealing with profit, and so the highest element in the row is identified. The next thing we need to do is to carry out column reduction, as in the case of the minimization method. And how do we do that? Identify the smallest element. Now you go back to your minimization method. The smallest element in the column. This is 30. This is 0. This is 0. This is 0. So in order to carry out a colon reduction, you subtract it from all other elements. 
This is zero, zero, zero. So anything subtracting zero will give you the same value. So nothing changes in the three other columns. The only column where the values will change is in the first column. 30 minus 30 gives us the sum of zero. 80 minus 30 gives us the sum of 50. 340 minus 30 gives us the sum of 310. And 390 minus 30 gives us the sum of 360. So this is our column reduction table. The next thing we need to do is to identify our number of unique zeros. Number of unique zeros. As in the case of minimization. So how many zeros do we have here? One, one, two, one. We go on to the row, number of unique zeros. This is two, one, one, one. And then we apply our straight line rules. Remember, ties are broken arbitrarily and you begin from either the row or the column with the highest number of zeros. So I rule this and this is my first line. I come again and I check. Okay, I have this. You can rule this this way. This becomes my second line. Is there any other covered zero? This is one and of course it is one. So I rule this, this is my third line. I have this. Ties are broken arbitrarily. I have one, I have one. So I can rule it this way and this becomes my fourth line. Wow. From this, we see that optimality has been attained because N is equal to N and N is equal to the number of lines. So we do not need to start identifying the smallest of covered element and subtracting it from all other elements because optimality has been attained. So the next thing we need to do is to assign our managers to our various locations. So that becomes our assignment table. And in order to get our assignment table, what does it become? Prince Will has the possible branches of going to either Lagos, or canoe when someone or a manager can be assigned to two locations you hold on with it Habak Singh can be assigned only to Aba and so you are signing directly to Aba and the profit that accrues from doing that is 1040 which is one million and forty thousand. Daniel can only be assigned to Abuja, and so he goes directly to Abuja. And the profit that accrues from going to Abuja is nine hundred and forty thousand. Nine hundred and forty thousand. Sarah can only go to Kano, so it solves our dilemma with Prince Will. And for Sarah to go to Kano, it would lead to a profit of one million one hundred and forty thousand, and that leaves Prince Will with only Lagos option. And for Prince Will to go to Lagos, it's going to lead to a profit of 950,000 Naira. Summing up the profit accrued is 4,070,000 Naira. And if they ask you to calculate the profit for the quarter, you multiply that by 3, which gives us 12 million. 210,000 naira. And so that's the case of how to solve a problem that deals with maximization. Thank you and God bless you. Till we meet again, the next time we we'll meet, we will talk about the branch and bound technique.
Let's bow our heads as we pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we are grateful to you for this class session. I pray that my audience will be blessed, will practice these things, and you will understand it. Bless everyone under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.